We have um, most of us on, but there may be a few more people that are joining us as we um, move forward here. I want to welcome each of you to the uh, first ESTS Community of Practice online meeting. And uh, we hope to have several of these, uh, well, three more for this <laughs> during this year. So I'm hoping that uh, you, you'll find them to be useful. Before, uh, I want to do a little roll call before we get into um, the meat of this to make sure that um, everybody is hearing, hearing the, the volume and can see the, the slides okay. So as I call your name, if everything's okay, just let me know. Uh, Kathy Lyle? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Erin Winters? Yep, everything's good here. Good. Sherry? Mm. Yeah, here. Everything's good. Stacy? We're here. How many is with you, Stacy? Ten. Ten. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Great. So yeah, um, we'll be doing some uh, discussions. So you can move the mic around uh, among the ten of you. Yep. All righty. Okay. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else that I haven't called? Michael? Mike Dyer. Mike I'm Dyer. Here. Yeah. Good to have you. Anybody with you? Uh, Chanel's here. Chanel. Okay. Are All right. Sherry and Don both on together? Say that again? Are Sherry and Don both on together? Sherry yeah. and Don. Okay. I thought I heard okay. that. Okay. Good. So we have um, the Ark of Washington County and Lower Shore Enterprises and United Needs and Abilities and Ark of Northern Chesapeake. Anybody I, I missed? Okay. Well, let's let's go then. So um, I would like to turn this over to Kathy Lyle with the Maryland Developmental Disabilities Council to give us a little welcome um, and launch before we get started. Sure. Good afternoon. Hi. I'm Kathy Lyle with the Maryland Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, I wanted to give a little background um, since uh, you folks are in um, the first year, but this is really a council initiative that has been in place for two years. Um, our, the council intent um, of this initiative is to improve employment outcomes of youth uh, with developmental disabilities by using customized training and technical assistance to providers. Um, what we intend, what our, our goals were through this initiative is so we wanted to see agencies build their capacity to provide customized employment services by making sustained organizational changes. Second one is DDA funded providers, local school systems and doors uh, 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 will improve planning and coordination of resources. And the third was the job supports are in place for students with developmental disabilities who are exiting school. We knew that there were um, the Mystic Project, the Maryland Seamless Transition Initiative, um, was in place in in many counties, um, and there was technical assistance to school systems. Uh, what our intent was to support those providers as the students exit. So for those folks who were serving what we would consider now become the folks becoming adults. Um, so in the first year, I think we supported four, five providers, and you are sort of the second cohort in year two. So we welcome you, and we look forward to working with you. Um, there, are there any questions you have of me? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you for outlining our three goals that we're working on together. And this. This particular activity of the ESTS project is, um, is for our group 
to work together to improve the employment outcomes, as Kathy said, for students in transition. It gives us an opportunity to interact on a regular basis. We have to do this on a quarterly basis. Um, I know that you, where you're meeting with me or Amy or Kelly in between that time to work on organizational um, processes and development, uh, your relationships with the key, key uh, stakeholders like DOORS and DDA and the school system. And this particular uh, agenda for today is to work on the third, continue working on the third goal, which is to build staff capacity to apply the employment supports that Kathy identified. So um, we're, we're happy to focus on that today. And if we can go through to the next slide, Amy Dwyer will be our um, key person that will take us through the assignments. Mm -hmm. all, uh, all of you attended the May 9th Customized Employment Training, the first one-day overview that Del Verstegen provided. And these assignments were, were given at the time. You've been great about sending your assignments to either me, uh, Kelly, or, or Amy for a review. And together, as a group, we're going to go over these assignments. So hopefully, you can uh, learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And then Amy's going to take us through an overview for the assignment three and four, which is uh, talking to employers. And Dale tells us that um, he didn't get to spend as much time as he wanted uh, going over the employer relations. So we're going to devote some time to that today. Um, the Brief uh, site updates we're going to hold to the very end so that this is really, this uh, community practice is doing what it's supposed to do where, where Amy is working with you and, and, and you're talking to each other about um, your results for one and two and any questions for assignment three, three and four. We'll end on calendar of events, so we'll talk about when your assignments are due and when the next um, online community of practice will occur, which is August 1st. So um, happy once again to see all of you online and um, willing to, to share with each other. So I'm going to turn it over to Amy um, so we can get on with our agenda. OK. Thank you, Deborah. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. This is Amy Dwyer from Transcend. Um, I've met some of you, but not all of you. Um, I wasn't there for that first training, um, but I know the material that, that Dale and Marie covered. So um, what we kind of want today to look like is you have the, the training and then the assignments um, that you started out with. So we kind of want to review how the assignments went, you know, why we actually did those assignments, um, and how they're going to lead into assignments three and four three and four, which are sort of the approaching the employer's um, side. So it's, it's the classic marketing where you have to know all of your audiences. And we wanted to start with knowing your, knowing your job seekers as well as you could so that then you could go and learn about the employers and make a good match. Uh, so we started with, uh, Maynard, if you could move to the next slide. <clears throat> so we started, obviously, with the discovery process. So this was the, the getting to know your job seeker. Um, so this is sort of, in marketing terms, you have to know your, the product that you're going to sell. And the more you know about them, um, the easier it is for you to be able to market them, obviously. And the more information, the more key information that you have. So I know that, that Dale and Marie talked a lot about gathering you know, information from a variety of sources um, and spending time with the job seeker in more than one setting. Um, and you know, the reason that we have learned over the years that we do that is that you learn so much more people when you see them in different situations. And everybody presents different skills, different behaviors, different everything to different people and in different environments. So um, if you can gather information to go on a positive personal profile from a bunch of different environments um, and talking to a bunch of different people, you just have a, you have sort of a richer document and you have more to work with. Because we, you know, we all act differently in different 
places and under different circumstances. You know, we don't act the same way on girls' night out on Friday night that we do Monday morning at work. We know how to adapt, and so does everybody else, whether you have a disability or not. So different stuff shows up. Um, some of it good, some of it not good, but you need to know if it's good, what is the environment and the triggers that makes that behavior come out, and if it's bad, same thing. What are the triggers that make it come out? And let's try to find an environment that, that avoids that. So I just wanted to ask you guys. I've looked at a few of these, but not all of them. Um, so I might, I might ask some people to talk a little bit about theirs. But when you went through that discovery option sheet and picked out you know, several different options of information gathering, was anybody surprised? Did anybody learn anything unexpected when you tried a different kind of um, discovery option? Anyone? Did you learn something new? Because some of you might have used you know, a person that you've worked with before, but you've never gone through this process with. Did anybody learn anything new trying a different way of discovery? They're all muted? No, they're not. OK. You're all. Are you un unmuted? <laughs> and I can't. Oh, yeah, go You can do it. Who else did it? Just you two? And Brian. OK. Um, and, I have, and I have a couple. Um, for instance, now, Dawn, I'm going to put you on the spot. I know you have to leave early, too, so I'm getting you early. Um, okay. Dawn, you, you actually, on the discovery option sheet, I think you did something for every possible category when you were working with, um, with Brian, because you did interviews, you observed in the classroom, you were at a park, you got paperwork, you interviewed the teacher, you interviewed the job coach, you interviewed mom, you interviewed Brian. Um, yours was very, very thorough and a lot of good detail. Um, what, did you learn different, did anything surprise you? Or did you learn something about Brian in one place that didn't come out in another, or? Um, the during initial interviews with, um, during his intake, we were strongly cautioned to keep Brian away from children. Um, and the question in my mind would be, why? What, what, is it, what is his thing with children? So sometimes people have very good reason. And when I delved in and I asked why, it was because he had snapped at a child in the library. Keep him away from children, keep him away from children, keep him away from children. And I'm thinking that maybe there was more to the story. Um, as I approached, you know, teachers and just kept my ears open, um, and other professionals kept my ears open, I heard none of that other than he had snapped at a child in the library. When I took him into different environments, I noticed that the pain, um, sound was painful to him. Um, it wasn't just an irritation. It literally went up his spine, and he would raise one leg and his arm up and, and kind of, like, twist his body. That's how painful, loud, unexpected noise mm -hmm. was for him. Um, in a quiet place that had an unexpected noise, he exhibited the painful behavior. When you took him into a place that was familiar and had a humming noise, such as Walmart, where he was familiar with because he was with his family, children could be as loud as they want. They could act up. They could run around. Um, we experienced parents screaming at their children, children screaming back at their parents. Um, <laughs> we, we experienced forklifts. We experienced you know, squealing wheels. We experienced things falling off the shelves, and none of it None of, none of it bothered him. None of it bothered him, none of it kept, kept, caught his attention, nothing. In the quiet place, we took him to Lowe's early in the morning where it's very quiet, and somebody had knocked something off a shelf, and it was painful. Somebody had banged into a ladder, and it was painful because it was unexpected. Um, so it is generally my feeling that it wasn't children that we have to worry about. It's the unexpected noises that they can make when they are supposed to be in a quiet environment. So the interruption of the quiet for him is really the problem. Yeah, because you're supposed to be quiet in the library. Well, the other thing I thought jumped out at me when I, when I read that was also his need for people need to follow rules. Yep. So it's very like, if this is the rule, this is what happens. And so it was almost a combination of the kid was noisy, plus the kid was in the library being noisy. Yep. And clearly well, that's, that. that's not the rule there. So that was almost a double whammy for him. like. The interruption of quiet plus, that's not what you're supposed to do in a library. <laughs> so, um, but I thought that was interesting that that you went through that whole process, took them to like a Walmart, to a Lowe's, you were at a park, and you were really observing to what extent, because it's not just noise, because some places were noisy, but if it was acceptable noise in that environment, it's like he adjusted and that was okay. Yeah. 
And I think that's a, that's a clear distinction between, you know, doesn't like kids, hates noise. You went, you went much further, um, which, I mean, ultimately will give you, first of all, more options of where to look for him and a much better idea when, you, when you're looking if that option is okay. And then the other thing is, is developing the level of support once he is in a place situation because it wants that place and the sounds that are in that environment become familiar to him. He learns what's acceptable and what's not. Something that may have been an unacceptable environment may somehow become acceptable as long as he has the proper support in place. Right, right. So I thought, yeah, and I thought that just because you, you tried something, you talked to so many different people, so you were getting, and we always have to keep in mind, when you interview a person, they have one, you know, they have their perspective of the job seeker due to their relationship. If it's mom, there's a mom-son relationship. If it's a teacher, it's a teacher-student relationship. Those are pretty distinct, and you have to remember that's not the only way that that person behaves. That's the interpretation from that one person, and it's an excellent angle to have, but it's not the end-all, be-all. So you had talked to teacher, job coach, and mom, and kind of got slightly, you know, some of it was similar and slightly different interpretations, so then you went out into the community. He out told me he doesn't like children. He doesn't yeah. have a problem with children. Yeah, so sometimes it, I don't know how many of the rest of you, when you were doing this, if you get um, conflicting information when you do interviews, because you're right, in this it did sound like there was some conflicting information, so you had to go out and sort of figure out on your own by observing him and taking him out what, what really is the case here. Because um, sometimes if we stop at, you know, interviewing someone, it's absolutely not going to do this. Like, if just that one person's opinion, and maybe it, you're right, it wasn't that one thing, it's something else about that situation that they can't do. But you need to know the specifics, and the more you see them in a number of environments and observe and talk to different people, I think, you know, the more you can drill it down to get specifics about what does work and what doesn't work with an individual. So I, that was a good one because I thought you did a nice job of, like, it was almost... Um, it was almost like you were a detective <laughs> trying to figure out what is it exactly that he okay, likes. Well, I didn't make the kids scream in Walmart, so nobody can blame me for that. <laughs> well, and that's all what, <laughs> you have to go. You have to go because that's real world. And you can never control, you know, like, oh, there'll never be a screaming kid in Walmart. Obviously, you can't. You, you need to figure out what is it that you can control and what can't you control and what level can he take of that. And so that, that will determine an environment. So, um, so I thought that was, that was a nice job. Did anybody else have any, um, like, discovery or learn, learn something in a setting or have contradictory information that you had to try to figure out? I thought that, I don't know, is, is Ray Ann on? I think that's her name. She's not. She's not with us today. Oh, okay. Um, she had really thorough descriptions in her discovery options, like really talking about the situations that I thought were interesting. I was going to ask her to, to go into that um, a, little more, a little more thoroughly. Is, is Katie or Ann? Katie or Ann on? Yeah. Yes. Um, I did... I thought leading into the, the PPPs on both of them were good. Um, Katie, I thought maybe if you could talk a little bit about Richard and what you learned. And you had a very thorough, um, positive personal profile. Uh, and Maynard, if you could go to the next slide, that will just remind people of all this, the stuff you're looking for in your personal profile. Um, with Richard, was there anything that you had that you learned new? I don't know if you had worked with him before and this was additional? No, I pretty much knew him just because he's here at our day program. Um, okay. I had really, he really only ever said he wanted to work at GameStop and once we started talking just about all different kinds of things, um, started throwing out all different kinds of things he was interested in like washing cars, construction work, um, antiques, he likes being outside, mowing grass, so he really, and then also once I got to the interview instrument and did that with him, that brought up things that just, 
doing the PPP didn't bring up. Right. Okay. Can you give Can you give any examples? Um, things that he didn't prefer to be around, um, as far as in his work environment. Okay. I'm trying to think. I didn't have time to read through this before we came back in here. Mm -hmm. um, he said he feels like he's nervous and shy when starting a new job, but then seeing him here in his group with his peers, I mean, he's not, he doesn't come across as being shy. So that's a little different. Right. Well, and that's also important to know because that means perhaps in his week on a job, he's not going to shine so much because he's nervous. But that's right. because it's more the transition mm -hmm. to we'll skills, which is not uncommon for anybody, um, right. but that, that means the job coaching up front is going to be a little different. It's going to be trying to make him comfortable right. and, and assuring the employer that, wow, once he's comfortable, he, you know, and settles in and, you know, he's really great, nervous in the beginning, and it's not the first time that I'm sure, you, you know, a new employee is nervous in the beginning, so, but that at least guides you into how do you, how do you present that first week and what do you... What's your goal for that first week? If you think, you know, if he's got the skills and he's interested, the goal is just to, to make him comfortable and feel confident. Because right. then he'll sort of kick into, you know, doing his best work. So um, I thought those were, those were nice and thorough. Is, is Anne on? Yes. Um, was there anything you learned about, it was Howard, wasn't it? Yes, Howard uh, uh, in the setting here in the uh, state services program, um, seems really laid back and um, has a real casual spirit. And one of the things I was surprised by was what he said he does in his downtime and what his interests are. And on the um, part of the interview, interviewing too, he talked. We talked about big dreams. Mm -hmm. His dreams were unlimited. He just continued on and on about what it was he wanted to do, and he just. I mean, it was it was never ending. He just continued, and I thought it was great that. Um, the Howard that we see here, um, he's just, he's, he's a dreamer. He really has um, big dreams for, uh, for his life. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I always think it's easier to work with somebody who has, it's hard when you say, you know, what's your dream? And they go, I don't know. You know, it's kind no, of like a whole conversation. That. <laughs> that's great. That's great. It just gives you more, it gives, certainly gives you more to work with. You know that, 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 that Howard will be motivated by something because he's got a lot of dreams. Yeah. So if you can try to find the, uh, the good match, that would be good. Okay. Um, yeah, I thought, the, I thought those are the ones I saw. Those were, those were good. Were there any um, parts of this positive personal profile that were more difficult to get information on or people struggled with really feeling how you filled it out? I had a problem with people coming up with their, their own positive personality traits. The, the demographic of the people that we're working with generally have a very negative image of themselves. And when you ask them what they do well, they can't tell you. But if right. you ask them what they don't do well, they have a, a litany, you know, longer than the Census Bureau. Um, so it's very hard for them to isolate what their skills are, what they do do well, or what they do, you know, on, on an average level, and um, they're, they, they really have never thought about it that way before. Well, for many people, you wonder, might this be the first time they've been asked directly? You know, and if they're coming from a system of lots of, uh, you know, the only time they're really gathered together to talk about there's, you know, IEP meetings, and sometimes those are not positive events <laughs> in their lives, so it's, it's hard to... Um, it's hard for them to, to figure out, yeah, what is it that I'm good at? And part of that, too, we're working with young people here. Part of it's just, you know, that the teenager, and there was not a lot of self-awareness at that age. If you look back to our own, you know, to ourselves, you know, did we, did we really know who we were at age 18, 19, 20? Um, so that can, that can be difficult. Yeah, that one, and so that one is a good example of, you know, just asking the person is it, not going to give you, um, a lot of stuff. That's where you need to ask other people and you need to observe because, you know, people don't understand that, you know, 
being very, you know, gracious and running ahead and opening the door all the time and being friendly to people, that that's a skill. But in the world of customer service and working in, a, in an office setting, or working in a team setting, that's a huge skill. But it's not, it, you know, it doesn't occur to a person that that's something that they're good at doing. It's just something they do naturally. Um, and they may not even realize that they're doing it. So, you know, that's where the observing comes in. And, and you kind of look at what are, what are some of those positive personality traits that in a certain setting is going to actually be seen as a skill. So anybody else have a, an area that was trickier to get at? Sometimes I hear a lot of, you know, values. How do you find somebody's values? Like, what, what does that mean? And for some people, for some people, it's very obvious. For John's person, Brian, he really valued following rules and making sure that everybody around him followed rules. And so that was going to affect how he responded to situations. Um, but that's also a great value to sell. He's not going to do anything. He's not going to do something wrong on work, at work on purpose because he values doing the right thing. So, um, but sometimes the, the values one is is hard to hard to capture on that one. So, um, anything else? Were there some that were really easy that were easy to fill out, easy to find? How do people do with learning styles? I thought I thought that was an area that um, um maybe. There could be more clarification on. Okay. Well, you know what? And in fact, that's good to let's take notes on that because we have a couple of like, you know, quick and dirty learning style sheets where you do, where it helps you sort of worksheets you can work on with somebody or hand it to them either way that gets at what is your learning style um, and why it's important to to know somebody's learning style. A lot of it is for um, how are they going to learn new tasks on a job. If someone, if someone has to see it, like they learn it visually, then you know that you can't just give them a checklist of what to do and know they're going to do it. You have to show them so they can visualize the steps and then they'll be fine. Um, if someone has a learning style where they really, you know, a lot of the kids with ADHD, they learn best when they're moving around. And their whole school career, they've been told to sit still. <laughs> so then they concentrate really hard on sitting still, but they, then they can't learn. So if you know a learning style someone, if they're moving around is when they're taking in their best information, then having a job where they have to sit still and learn, again, it's not going to work. So it's got to be, they got to be moving around, a job where they're moving around and learning while they're doing. Um, so those are some of the kinds of things. But if maybe we can um, email everybody just some examples of some quick and dirty, like multiple intelligences is somehow how it's learned. Lear um, discovering your learning style. Um, and it's fun to actually do on yourself as well. <laughs> um, and to try it out with colleagues and then see if you can do it with with job seekers if they really if you don't if it's hard to figure out sort of what their learning style what their learning style is. So we can um, we can send send out some of those little worksheets to see if that helps people. And if, if there's anything anything on temperament that would be helpful as well. Yeah, that's, that's also, that can be, um, and that one doesn't even show on the circle here, but we do add it on that one. And a lot of that has, comes from observation, I think. You know, are they really mellow most of the time? Are they agitated? What is it? What is their temperament? Like in using Brian as an example, um, he's fine and mellow and, you know, goes with the flow when it's right, and then there's a sudden stop in his, a change in his behavior when there's a loud interrupting noise, you know, so there's an interruption to that calming temperament. So I, a lot of that comes with observation. And I think it's in helping match with the right environment of a workplace, that's where that comes in and is really helpful. That one's tough. I don't have any, I don't have any temperament worksheets kind of stuff. I think that over time is is just observing and seeing how they react, seeing how somebody reacts in different situations shows temperament a lot. So like when Don took, you know, went to Lowe's and then went to Walmart to see how they reacted in different environments, you can sort of 
gather the temperament. So, um, on the Maynard, if you can go to the next slide. Once you you have completed, and you know what, I hate to say completed a positive personal profile because I don't think it's ever really complete. It's one of those sort of dynamic um, sheets that every time you go out or you talk to or you meet with a job seeker, you might learn something new. Um, and so you can just keep adding to it. And I know there are agencies that have it in their, like in their share drive. The other thing that, that kills me, and I noticed when people were writing, those little boxes, they tend to limit us. We think we can only put one word responses in because they're tiny little boxes, um, which makes me nuts because whenever I do and I got arrows, I got whatever. So I've just learned to, to make the boxes bigger, change them around, and do like four boxes on a page and have a you know, four-page long thing so I don't, feel, I don't feel constrained in any way. And for some agencies, they put it on their share drive, so each document is a different box. So you can add, it can be endless what you can add to it. Because um, sometimes if you can, you can write out, you can just put one word that describes it, an example of why you put down that one word description really clarifies when you're looking later or if somebody else is coming to look at the positive personal profile. It gives more detail. But the, that, those little boxes are very limiting. So don't feel like you have to be limited by the value. If you want to change the shape or, you know, or do it online so you can just keep filling in, that's great. So how do you guys, what are different ways that you can use a positive personal profile? Like what can you do with that information that you've gathered? Because there's a number of different things you can do with that. It's kind of one place where you collect all the stuff you've gathered. So if you've done other assessments and career assessments and observations and skill tests and you've done all this, it's all landing in one page or at least in one document. And it's a document that kind of the way it's worded, it kind of forces it to have a positive spin. So it's a nice place for everything to land, all that information to land. What can you then do with that? Anyone have any ideas? It can relate to homework or helping the individual figure out, you know, what they want to do for the next year. Goals. Right. Right. Setting goals, goal planning. For a lot of the individuals we work with, they've never seen all this information about themselves in one place. So it's a good place to start with, wow, look at these skills. Wait, look, I can do this. And wait, I love to do this. And I don't I don't want to do that. So what should I be looking for? You know, it gives people an idea of the, a picture of themselves, sort of a snapshot of themselves right there to, to launch some goal setting. So that's a, that's a good one. I mean, when they do them in school, I think it's a great way to write their IEPs and their transition plans. Um, when they get to you guys, it's a great way to, you know, to launch their job search plans by writing some goals. So that was a good one. Um, anything else? Any other ways that you can use this? I've had some... Um some family members enlightened by the information that was shared because they never, I don't know if they never, but it's a different spin on, um, you know, seeing um, right. the person. So. Absolutely. I think that's great when, um, when it's eye-opening to families. Because, uh, honestly, again, the families, their experience probably <laughs> talk about our son or daughter is going to an IEP meeting which is, you know, officially you have to sign documents, and a lot of times they're not all that positive. Um, so if, that, if it can help a, a family say, wow, well, maybe he can do this, because part, part of what guides anyone is expectations. So if everybody around somebody has just has low expectations, then that person will probably reach that low bar. But if everyone around him goes, whoa, you got some skill, he can do this, well, maybe he can go out and get a job, and you raise that bar, 99% of the time, that person just goes right up and reaches the bar. So um, if you can pump up the people around them and pump up the person, the expectation rises a little bit. Um, and sadly, sometimes the only thing that keeps people from being successful is expectations. And it's, such, it's not even that concrete a thing, so it's, it's unfortunate. So if a process like this can change somebody's expectations or at least have them think differently about, you know, their son or daughter, that's
So, uh, Maynard, if you can go to the next slide, I have some other examples of what can be done. This is a great tool to use for developing a resume or any sort of portfolio, especially how many of you have um, young people coming to you who've never had a job before or only had like one or two or volunteer. Hard to make a resume without a lot of experience because in the past we think of a resume as a list of all your experience. But you can create, you know, a skills, skills and assets kind of resume and the stuff that ends up on a positive personal profile is great to pull from that and put onto a resume. Can also help them prepare for interviews because an interview is, you know, asking them what they're good at, what their talents are, and what they have to offer. That's everything on a positive personal profile. So it can, you know, learn a little bit about yourself. That's what you need to talk about in an interview. If you're going to actually, for those individuals who can go on an interview, it gives them more stuff to talk about. Um, already mentioned developing goals or any sort of plan. Um, also helps in determining further assessments or work experiences. Um, and Sherry, are you are you still there with Dawn? Yes, I'm here. Because um, I loved what you did with um, Stevie, who's actually a girl, like Stevie Nicks. I, oh, now I only see her as Stevie Nicks, frankly. <laughs> For her, with the long flowy. Um, okay. <laughs> she, um, all she wanted to do was work with animals, and people were a little hesitant. Could she, you know, could she do that? Was it safe? So you had found two places. I mean, that it helped you determine that. Well, we need to see her in. This is her dream job, but nobody convinced necessarily that she would be good at it, and she didn't really have any experience with it. So you you went to two different places and went with her, and um, she ultimately got a position to try at least a volunteer position in one of those places. Isn't that right? Yes, that's right. And the, they are willing to train her on the, the weaknesses that I identified. They're willing to work with her to help develop those. That's great. So what what were some of the your biggest concerns with CV working with the animals? Well, when I took her out, uh, I took her to an animal hospital. And when I took her in, um, she was given the verbal prompt to keep her hands away from the cage. She can she kept sticking her fingers in, even with the verbal prompt. Um, she had no fear. She was not able to read. Um, the fact that the animal was large um, it, and it, they were growling, um, she wasn't able to take the visual facial cues of the animal first, as well as the auditory cues that the animal might not want to be touched, um, and it was a safety concern. When I took her to um, a swim center and ha had someone work with her to try to teach her initially um, some basic animal cue reading, she did. She listened, but she didn't follow through, and that concerned me that she would need lots of education and repetition in order not to get bit by a large animal if I tried to market her at a kennel or some of the traditional places. That's why I had to think out of the box right. um, to find the position for her so she could still have the connection with the animals that she desired and learn to read the had somebody work with her one-on-one -on -one to read the animal cues over a period of time. This is something that's going to take a lot of repetition. So that's what I did. I, I looked at the pet because I resorted to looking at the pet gazette, um, and I started following dog bakeries, and um, I took her to a natural you know, animal food store just to try to think out of the box to find her something um, to make a connection with the animals, but a safe one. And where did she yeah. end up? She ended up at a, a wonderful place called the Puppy Fashion Boutique, where they sell dogs' uh, clothes. Um, it's very bright, very cheery. And they're going to teach her stocking. They are going to teach her how to. She's working um, very uh, regularly with the animal uh, groomer. She's going to teach her how to do grooming. She's having her work in the salon as well as in their day, puppy daycare center. So. She gets to interact with the animals, gets to do that rep repetitious um, practice that she needs. And a lot of the animals that she sees are repetitive uh, boarding animals that, that come there for doggy daycare. So she gets the opportunity to work with animals that, are, that she's never seen before as well as 
to establish uh, the relationship with animals that she sees repetitively. Okay. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that was a great um, process that you went through to get her to the, you know, to a place that matches her needs. And and obviously, you know, those are those are concerns. Like sometimes having too much fear with an animal is a concern, but not having enough fear, like you said, like there's an animal growling with very sharp teeth, and and that's not right. A good for for me, you know? safety is the number one concern when I'm trying to find a proper match for the person that I'm supporting. I would not. I would feel terrible if I put her in a situation where I was where there wasn't the proper support for her available. Yeah. So that that's good. And and then being able to explain that to the supervisors and so they understand that's what they need to work on, but at least they're understanding enough and saw enough of her skill and just her love of animals that they're willing to work with that. And so, and so much they also are willing to provide her with additional training when um, a Saturday they're having a person come in that works with some of the um, other individuals there and they're willing to train her and give her additional training to help support her as well uh, with a behavioralist. So this was a perfect position for her in my mind. Yeah, that was a, that was a nice job. And that's where sometimes, yeah, d determining if you need more assessment or some work experience or trying some of the stuff um, comes from doing a, a positive personal profile. The last one that I um, think, which is, this is sort of the bridge between the discovery side and learning about a job seeker and then getting your foot in the door to a business is using this to develop a marketing script. Uh, and Mater, if you go to the next slide, um, and I, I know that Dale Free probably touched on, they touched on the concept of, of the features to benefits, which is a classic sales and marketing very different way to sell. Uh, if you can take that positive personal profile and first create even a general features to benefits sheet, which I, I do with all, it's almost like a, uh, a task list of, of stuff for each individual before you start the job developing. So it, I literally do two columns, features on one column, benefits on the other. And let's pull off those features you found um, on your positive personal profile, you know, and, and then how, you know sort of the area, so so with Stevie, you know, love of animals, passion for animals. How would that benefit, um, if you're going to look for places that are pets, how, are you, how is that going to benefit them? Obviously, you know, making customers feel comfortable handing their pet over to somebody who clearly, you know, really loves animals. You know, there's lots of benefits that you can talk about so that you have a general idea when you're going in to meet with employers and you're targeting for some person, you know sort of what, you're listening to what they are looking for and you know what you kind of have to offer in terms of a good employee. Then after going on an informational interview, which is what we're going to talk about next and is one of your assignments, how you can turn that features to benefits into something really specific. Now you've done this positive personal profile on an individual. After an informational interview, it's almost like a profile of that business and really turn that sheet into something very specific. You pull out the assets that you need that really shine, and how is it going to benefit that particular manager or that business? So with maybe with Dawn's, if you had Brian, he very much, you know, follows the rules. If he's looking for, you know, a, a job, like he, like he wants to, like in a library, Clearly, there are rules. Like you can't, you can't just put the books away willy nilly. You can't file that. You know, there's a lot of rules in a library that keep it organized. That that would be a real benefit. That he's a stickler to those details. Um, so the library is going to be organized and it's going to be run smoothly because of that skill of his. And that's very specific to that business. So it almost gives you your marketing script when you're eventually going to sell that person to a business. And if you can turn all those features of a person into something that totally hits their bottom line. They saves them money, makes them more money, improves their customer relations, you know, runs with something runs more efficiently because of this person's skill. It all talks to bottom line. They're gonna save or make more money. 
um, because what we want is we want employers to have their decision to hire one of our job seekers. It's a business decision. It's a smart business decision because it positively affects their bottom line. So that's what we're trying to sell. And going through this process of pulling out all these features of, a, of an individual and then going through the process of figuring out exactly what the needs are of a business and putting them together in this kind of marketing script. And then even I've, I've sent um, proposals to businesses that literally bullet point, here are the features and how they would benefit you. I mean, there's nothing clearer than that. It's easy to read, put in bullet points, and it's kind of a no-brainer then. It's harder to say no when you're like, well, that's a really, a really logical argument. But you get there by going through this process, which leads us into what are the next assignments, um, which is the next step. This is sort of the way the training was set up and the way these assignments are set up was uh, um, working with your different customers, the first customer being the job seeker, an equal customer is the business person. So what do you do now to do your research and your discovery on business? Um, so Maynard, if you could go to the next slide. It's just, you now is where you have to get your foot into, in the door of businesses. And first of all, even what businesses do you go to? And that's, once you do this positive personal profile, you have an idea, there's brainstorming about, oh, you know, she wants to work with animals working directly in a vet, you know, hospital is, might not be the safest. I have to brainstorm where are other places where she comes in contact with animals. You can see that whole process, and then you can pick some places. But now you have to get your foot in the door. Um, on to the next slide, please. Um, when you're getting your foot, and when you're approaching businesses, what is it that they want to hear from us? Do they want to hear, you know, hi, it's nice to meet you. Will you hire this person with a disability? Probably not. That's, it's really easy for them to say no. They want to hear more about what you can do for them. So if you have motivated candidates who are excited about working, that's kind of who they want to hire. Candidates with skill sets that add value to their workforce that will positively affect your bottom line. So business solutions that improve the company's productivity and, and or workflow. So when you present it that way, it's as though like I'm, I'm working for you. I work with local businesses to improve their, you know, fill their hiring needs, improve their business efficiency or productivity. You're working for them. And that's the sale that you want. Um, so that's, that's, your, that's your approach. Uh, if you go to the next slide. All right, go on to the next slide. I'm it's coming. Not. It's coming. It's loading. 90%. <laughs> no. I talk more in between. The poor thing can't go as fast as my mouth. <laughs> it's a picture. A photo. Um, all it's going to talk about, yeah, the next slide is because it has a big picture. It's just talking about what the informational interview is. And I know that, that Dale and Marie touched on this. This is getting in into a business to find out about their needs. So every time you talk to a business, it is a sales call. But you want to do it in baby steps. So this informational interview is you just want to get in and you kind of want to find out how that, how that business runs. And it's good rather than just you know, looking on the website, which you always start with, so you have information going in, but just to, understand, to get a feel for the culture of the workplace. Um, which is like what Don did going into Lowe's and then going into Walmart. It was very different. You know, for Brian, if there's constant noise, it's okay. If it's eruption of noise, it's not. Where does that happen more often? You know, so going in and the approach really is, you know, hello, I'm an employment counselor. I have a lot of, you know, uh, job seekers who are really interested in your industry. If it's retail you're approaching, if it's healthcare, whatever it is. Um, you know, but all retail stores and all healthcare um, businesses run differently. I'd love to come in and learn about your company, how you guys run, what it is you're looking for, um, to make sure that I'm preparing my individuals interested in this field to, in the right direction, so that I know exactly what you're looking for, um, and just find out about your business. So, and just ask for about 15 minutes of their time to come in and learn about it and see if you can at least be in the business. Sometimes they can't always give you a tour, but you can get a sense by just being there. Um, okay, next slide, please. 
If the goal of the informational interview is, is different than just going out knocking on doors and asking for a hire. Um, the do you have any jobs question is an easy out. Not a fair question, like will you hire my students? They, have, they don't know what your students can do. They have no idea. They don't have enough information. Plus, if you haven't gone in and learned about them, you don't even know if, you, if it's good for your, your job seeker. So um, other than do you have any jobs, it's again, I'd like to learn more about your company. Let the employer talk, um, just so you can listen. Um, on to the next slide, please. These informational interviews do let you, oh, there's fancy, there's fancy stuff going on with those slides, but take so long to load. Um, informational interviews are really the way to get your foot in the door um, because it's it's really it's low pressure. It's low pressure. You're not you didn't say will you hire somebody to an I just want to come and learn about your business. No problem. But I know I know my business. I can share that with you. It's a chance to make a first grade impression. So you go in. You've you you know search their website. You have you know questions for them that make sense. It's the, really the start of a working relationship um, because people work with people they like. So by the time you're going to be asking for a hire, you've developed a relationship with somebody. So when they're coming in, you know, this, you know, they walk, you walk in and say, "Hey, oh, hey, Katie." You know, it's easier to ask, you know, something from somebody who knows you than to ask from a stranger. So you're starting a relationship, and the goal is you're going to uncover some possible opportunities in the job. By going and seeing a business, you can see, wow, that area runs a little slower. Ooh, this area is always a mess. Or, you know, maybe they need some help they didn't even realize they needed. So um, if you can go to the next slide, some of the things to look for. And I know as part of your assignment, there was an informational interview sheet. It's the same limitations with those boxes. So some people like those, some people don't. So when I'm done talking about this, I think if we can pull up, I have another just list of questions to get at some of these answers. Um, there it is. Yes. yes. So you can look at this. We'll have this email to you as well. You're trying to get at the flow of, of business, if there's seasonal times, if there's areas, you know, where they're pulling people who get paid a lot more to do stuff like straighten things up or to organize something that's not really their job, um, you're trying to get at some of that information. So there's the overview, there's questions to ask about the workforce. Um, can you go on the next? I know I, get, I put up a document that's got a number of pages. Um, jobs that potentially match your caseload. So now you're trying to get at what kind of tasks, what kind of personalities are the people who work here, um, what kind of training goes on. Um, recruitment, how do you recruit, what's your hiring process, because our goal is to have um, our job seekers go through the typical hiring process as much as possible with us giving accommodations. Um, and I think there's one more page. Yes, workforce related issues and sort of a wrap up. So I take this list of questions with me. Also it's just comforting when you know, you're talking to somebody and they can just draw a blank at any point. You have these questions to pull from. Um, and just gather some information. So you're going in at least with the, you know, with the backup of information um, that you want to get at and some questions to get there. So um, we'll send you that as well. And a lot of they're getting at the same stuff that's on that informational interview worksheet that came along with the assignment. Um, and the assignment is to complete that informational interview worksheet. But you can do that by asking a lot of questions. You'll get a lot of that information. Um, okay, you can go back to the to the slide. Thank you. So you're trying to find out sort of what the business is known for, uh, what's required, if there's any, you know, production challenge, any challenges, if there's seasonal and they get a rush at a certain time or a certain time of day or, you know, whatever it is. Um, I've gone into businesses where they, on certain days, the truck drops off all their, you know, for um, clothing retail, drops off their stuff and it's like a frenzy in the back and they have to pull cashiers and it's a mess on those days. They could use extra help, you know, getting at those kinds of things. Preferred approach, how do you want me to contact you? Do you, you know, I have some employers that are like, you know, if you could text me, 
just like texting employers, but that's what they ask. Some are emails. Some like you to come in. Um, it depends. Um, and then are they hiring and for which positions, which you might not even have to ask, but you'll hear during um, one of these informational interviews. Uh, next slide, please. You want to be on the lookout for possible ways to improve the workflow. If you see something that doesn't make a lot of sense, a lot of times businesses run because that's the way they've run for years. But on the outside, you can be like, well, that's, you know, as a customer, I'd prefer this. And if you could maybe present somebody who could make that change for them, it could improve their bottom line. Uh, if there are employees that are bogged down with important yet non-essential tasks that are attached to them that maybe a, a person when your job seeker is coming in at entry level could take from them so they could focus on the work they were really hired to do. Um, core staff who struggle to manage their workloads. A lot of people are running, still businesses are thin right now because of so many layoffs over the last couple of years. There are people who are overloaded, but they're not willing to hire managers back. But entry level to come in and sort of relieve some of the pressure um, is what a lot of businesses are doing. Are there unhappy customers? Because obviously it needs to be a change in how they approach their customers. Duties that might be performed in a different way, but could still yield you know, outcomes. How flexible is the workplace? You know, what's the, what's the culture of the workplace? Is it like one big happy family? Is it everybody, you know, everyone does their own thing? Um, do they work in teams? Do they not? Seasonal fluctuations and just general problem areas that could use somebody to come in with a simple solution. They just haven't thought of it. So these are things to uh, look for when you're with the business. And on your end, if you could, uh, next slide, please. Your goal here then is to help the employer to either serve more customers, improve services, um, increase the efficient use of their resources, their time, their staff, save money, earn more money. It is bottom line. Um, and that's what we're trying to get at with this next assignment. So for those of you, for, if you started a positive personal profile and did the discovery options for someone, I would recommend that's the person that you then go on and do the informational interview for. Uh, now, for some of you, uh, like Sherry, you, you, your person, you did that already, and they found a job, that might, you can go ahead and write that one up. You know, what did you do when you went and met with the employer? What did you learn? How did you present CV to them and write that up in, the, in a proposal? Um, so for assignments three and four, which is the next slide, it's the informational interview, which we talked about. And there's an informational interview sheet that you can record information up. So filling that out with the information you find out when you go out and meet with the business. Um, again, setting that up is honestly just, you know, I'm, I'm a help my job seekers. You know, not, you're not going to say I want you to hire somebody. Low pressure. Then what the next assignment is, is the employer proposal. So if there is a match, your, your job seeker would match, how are you going to sell? That's, and, uh, and I say for this proposal, write it up in, in a letter, as though you were writing them a letter, um, about why you think your candidate would benefit them. And you can do a features to benefits right within that letter. Um, and there's a template that came with your assignment that shows you the, the different areas. But your goal is to sort of review what you learned from that informational interview, recognize what their needs are, and then present a person who can match those needs. Now, in real life, if you go on in an informational interview and you realize that this is not a good fit for your <laughs> candidate, that's fine, too. Still write up a proposal that you're you just may never mail that to them because it's, you know, you realize it's a good match. But for this exercise, it's how you present, make your, your initial sell of your job candidate to this employer that you did an informational interview on. It's the follow-up. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody try this or have any reservations about this, either part of this assignment? Amy, this is Kelly. Um, yeah. 
I just wanted to, to speak to the informational interview for just a second. Um, and this is Kelly Crane. I'm, I'm a colleague at, of uh, Amy's and Deborah's at Transcend. And I had an opportunity just last week in another state that we're working with to go out and interview employers regarding the services they receive from employer specialist, employment specialists. And what we learned um, by talking, and, and we asked all the same questions. We asked um, the role that the employment specialist played with placing somebody there, the services they received from the, those, that employment specialist, and the benefits of those services. What we learn from employers is really the importance of the informational interview. As Amy said, really going in and learning their needs, their labor needs, the skills that are required for certain positions, the culture of that organization, so that there is that good match. So, you know, I think we're, you know, a lot of us are in this field because we like working with young people and we've, we've got that part down. The employer piece is, you know, the employers are another one of our customers that we need to work with. And so I just, you know, I, I what Amy shared with you and how to conduct that informational interview um, is so important to really keep in mind. You're not going in right now to say, hey, I got this kid, do you have a job for them? You're going in to learn about them. And we found employment specialists who take that time to learn the needs of the employers and are honest about a match and making a good match. Those are the placements that, um, and we're working with VR, that turn in to those successful closures. Um, those employment specialists who were going in saying, hey, do you have a job? I got this kid who's interested in working in a pet store, oftentimes, um, actually more often, those placements never worked out. So that informational interview is really a, a critical step in the work that we do um, in providing services to employers. Yeah, that's great. Now, Kelly, would you say when you talk to those employers, a lot of them felt like that employment specialist was kind of working for them? You know, um, it's interesting because there's um, four different employment specialists. So we talked to um, employers that were served by these different employment specialists. And just what we know from the work we do with the employment specialists, um, one of them skips and has doesn't doesn't really hasn't drank the Kool-Aid yet on the informational interview. And it was evident when speaking with the employers because we did hear, um, you know, she they didn't feel like that employment specialist worked for them. It was only one of the, the four we looked at. The other employers really talked about, you know, Aaron's really there for me. Um, he knows what my needs are. I know he's not going to dump um, somebody on me was one of the quotes. Um, they also um, said stuff, you know, Aaron told me that he didn't have a match, um, but he would keep in touch. You know, so employers appreciate that honesty. Um, and they, you're right, Amy, they want to know that you're there working for them as well. You're providing them a service. Yeah, that's great. When we actually hear that from employers, you know, we know we're on the, we know we're on the right track because we're in a service industry. That's what we do, and we have to serve our customers. And we're really good at serving our job seekers, and where we haven't been so good in our field is serving our business customers. And it's good to hear when they say, you're doing a good job and you're not doing a good job. For a business, an employment specialist doing a good job is working for them, listening to their needs, so they can trust that you're not, you know, that, that you're finding somebody who will really fit into their business. And you can't know that unless you know that business and you ask a lot of questions and you let them talk. Um, and frankly, informational interviews are fun. There is no, there's not a ton of pressure. No. Businesses love talking about themselves. And you learn so many things. I go to businesses I didn't even know existed. And they give you a tour and talk about candle factories and NASA chip you know, producers for rockets. I mean, I go through all sorts of things that you would no idea they're fascinating. Learning how to make a, a ball bearing for trains. 
That was one of my favorites. Up in the machine, learning how the machine works. I mean, that is, you know, that's a good day. When, when you get to learn something new like that, it's fascinating. So informational interviews should not be scary. They're actually quite fun. You learn a lot. And people like to talk about their business. And if you're there asking a lot of questions and kind of inferring how cool their business is, um, yes, that launches a really that launches a really good business relationship. So, does anyone have any comments, or are there anything if, if expectations or fears, um, or you've done it before with or without success? Okay, well, if you, if you have any questions while you're doing it or you're having a hard time getting one set up, you know, um, third liaison, you, you know, Deborah, Kelly, or myself, um, I'm figuring out, you know, how we can get some of the, get it set up. Because um, maybe, I think the, the biggest fear is getting it. Once you have the appointment, going on that is, is not a problem. They're expecting you, you know, you're just there to learn information. Um, and it, it, you're starting a business relationship. They're, they're actually pretty fun. Um, and then getting the idea of just practicing how you make that. How do you make that sell? Because it's really we're in marketing. You know, you're a salesperson. So um, this, you just have, you know, the most interesting product to sell because it's a person. So this is, these are the steps that take you through that process from getting to know this job seeker to getting it all in one document to making a features to benefits marketing script, to the informational interview and finding out about them, and then matching the features to benefits right to that employer and making that proposal. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, why don't we go to the next slide then that has the um, calendar of events so okay. we know um, the timing. So you have until July 24th for assignments three and four to be due. So that you know gives you a full month to be able to contact employers, set up a, a, you know the interview, and then fill it all out. And on August 1st, that's when we're going to have this again. So we'll talk about your experience with those assignments, um, what happened, what did you learn, good experiences, bad experiences, you know, this happened, how would I deal with it? We can all, you know, people can offer their, um, their different experiences. August 20th is the Maryland's Organizational Change Network meeting, and you'd be getting information, right, Deborah, about location and all that stuff. Absolutely. Okay, and then October 17th, see, here we are, we're back to school. We're deep into school, October 17th, summer's over. I always feel like that happens so fast. Um, is another one of these online meetings, so, um, we will pick a topic. We don't have the topic yet. Some of that might come out when we have our, our next um, community practice meeting. Then November 19th is uh, another Organizational Change Network meeting. And then the last one of the year, December 12th, because we're all getting ready for the holidays and it's cold out. It's so weird right now. <laughs> our last community practice online meeting. So that's why you just have it all in sort of one place. You will be getting notifications and all sorts of stuff to remind you of this, you do not have to commit any of this to memory. <laughs> but just to give you a picture between now and the end of the year for how this will work. Any questions on that? Uh, hey, I, I did want to tell everyone that this particular, all the si uh, sessions, these uh, online meetings are being recorded. And we will um, post them on a site where you can go and get get the uh, the recording. It'll be archived there. So if you want to hear something that, uh, again, that, that we talked about, you can review it. Or if you want to share it with other people in your organization, mm -hmm. it'll be there for you. So what we'll do is send out a link to you once it's been ar archived so you can go there. And it's just for, for you. It's just for the community of practice. Um, group, it's, for, it's the learning material for you. And Amy, we also will send out the two handouts that you spoke about, right? The um, questions, and there was one more. The learning styles, I'll find some learning style stuff. Learning style, yeah, learning style information. So, you know, we're, we're built, we'll be building um, 
some information material for you as well as uh, this listening event and participation event for you to access. So by the time we finish this year, you'll have four recordings. Um, so uh, as Amy said, uh, July 24th gives you plenty of time to get out there and, and talk with employers. Uh, call me or email me or Amy or Kelly if you're having some difficulties or if you have questions. If you do them um, and you uh, have more questions, put that on your assignment sheet for us to, to talk to you because we're giving you feedback as you go through these. Um, so it's, it's all about, um, and this is all about learning. I mean, if you, it's trying something on that's a little different if you're not doing some of these um, activities and how it might improve your uh, delivery of employment services. Do you have any questions? Any comments? Can can you tell me if this kind of uh, meeting is uh, beginning to meet your needs? Do you like it? Don't like it? Yeah, I think it's helpful and it's easier than driving a distance to get together. <laughs> well, that, that must have been Stacy, right? That was me. We're way out in Washington County, so we appreciate this. Um, oh, the other thing that I just noticed is you guys are portable because I'm taking you with me or my job interview. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> your pizza in and I was able to stay for the entire time. So thank you. Oh, good. Oh, good. That's excellent. And I hope you're pumped for the job interview now. Get yeah, that. we're pumped. Ready to go. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, Mike Dyer from United Needs and Abilities. I'll say two things about it. One, I'll echo, echo that it is nice to not have to do the travel, so it's more, more productive. Uh, and I also believe that the information here was much more practical and to the point uh, than what I experienced in, in Baltimore. So I did find this more helpful. Well, good, Mike. You think it helped going out there and uh, doing those first two uh, exercises and then talking about it more applied to your work? Yes. Okay. Well, that, that's, that's good feedback. Of that, because it's hard just to, you know, we don't want to just dump the info on you and then go, all right, good luck. You know, <laughs> some of it, you know, and, uh, and then talk about how that worked, how that didn't work, and how we can make changes. So hopefully that does, yeah, make it easier. Yeah, you know, sometimes you just have to get the information out there. But you know, what we we've all all worked in training for so long that it, it's not very uh, fulfilling for us as, as trainers and technical assistance providers just to dump all this stuff on you and say good luck. You know, we we like to see see changes as well and to work with you as you're working with the with the material and. Um, how we can help you make changes and meet the needs within your organization. So, yeah, thanks for the feedback. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, if you want working with your um, with your liaison too, if one of these informational interviews, I mean, it's something that I'm doing with the the of Northern Chesapeake is going on those together because sometimes it's helpful to see other people's style, you know, and pair up and do it with different people and say, oh, I like how he got that information out of that employer, or that was really clever how he turned that around, or that was a good way to get in the door. You know, sometimes it's just you just want to, I'm very visual, and so I like to see how other people do stuff, and then, you know, I I borrow their technique, which is totally allowed. And Amy, thanks for bringing that up, because part of the technical assistance that you have available to you is where we do go out in the field with you. and. Um, work with your own community and whether it's an informational interview or working with an individual and help, helping you brainstorm on um, supports or environments that, that would work for them. So that's um, something that Kelly, and Amy, and I will be following up with you just to see how um, the in the field uh, training will, will work for you after we get through these, these four assignments. You'll have a better idea if you if you need a little more assistance from us. Okay. Well, so the all the the go-to meeting 
uh, webinar technology work for you, sounds like. May I want to thank you for your assistance and getting everybody on board and uh, our slides up and so that we're communicating. Next time, it, it will not be our first, it will be our second, so we'll, we'll be uh, well into being users of this kind of uh, technology. So until we, any other comments before we go, any more questions? Well, do we want any, does anybody have any updates? Okay, we have time. And, we yeah, any, any of you have any updates about maybe summer youth employment or getting uh, one of your uh, your exiters a, a new job, working with with doors or the school system, anything along that line you'd like to share? Any organizational information or that you're considering? A cool job someone found. <laughs> a cool job. <laughs> I don't think we're quite ready to share that yet, unfortunately. We're still getting together our list of individuals that we're helping, and um, so we don't really have much to report yet. Well, getting your list is a good place to start, so. Okay, well, we did that much. All right, that's great. So we made our list. And Stacy, y'all have been out talk, going to visit other providers, right? Correct. As a way of, of learning. You want to talk about that just for a second? Sure. Well, we had a chance to visit with Penn Mar, and last week, um, Arc of Northern Chesapeake was gracious enough to host us for a visit. Um, so we've had a chance to look at some other providers and how they provide uh, more customized employment and individualized services in the community, and that's helped our group get a frame of reference for how we can proceed. That's great. Okay. Does the Lower Shore Consortium have anything to, to Talk about your any new developments for you? Yeah, we're good. <laughs> okay. Who was that? We're good. Audrey. Audrey. How about the consortium, which is um, United Lower Shore? Um, help me, Mike. Uh, uh, Somerset. United Needs and Abilities. We have Lower Shore. We have Somerset and Abilities Network. Okay. And uh, I. But we have not gotten together as a group, so I can't speak for the consortium itself. We, we, we need to get together as a group, but um, uh, we don't have any other updates from United Needs and Abilities at this point. Okay. Park of Northern Chesapeake? Any updates from you? Um, nothing on, uh, on uh, at the group level. Um, I had an interesting experience yesterday on a job assessment slash exploration and I work with a master mason and learned how to lay bricks and what is the top of the brick and what's the bottom of the brick and it sounds like it would be easy but it's not. There's actually a distinct <laughs> top and bottom twister block. Um, <laughs> and I also learned that while my person isn't ready for the job that he wants, there's another position open um, where people actually clean up after the masonry and it's not construction site cleaning, it is a specific job specific to masonry of where you um, knock um, some of the imperfections off the brick that have horribly um, descriptive names um, that I will not repeat here. <laughs> so, well, thanks um, for sharing that. About, yeah. I found out about an entire industry that I never knew existed. Um, that was kind of fascinating. I'm like, where do you find that kind of job? And it's like word of mouth. Okay, well, awesome. <laughs> what are you talking? More master masons. So, <laughs> thanks. Interesting things that you pick up along the way. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> okay. Well, we will end this session, and um, we look forward to talking with you again in August. Thank you. All right. Thanks, thanks. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.